And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, uh, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this, unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21, how be it this kind goes out, uh, goes not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now we, we're in our second week this week uh, of fasting and, and, and our, our yearly fast. And so, um, you know, hang in there. The enemy's, the enemy's going to come against you and, and, and we'll see that. We'll see the attacks of the enemy continuing and continually. Uh, but, but God is, God is so much, so much greater. And then in, in Luke chapter 18, um, verse one, and he spake a parable unto them saying to this end, men ought always to pray and not faint. Men ought always to pray and not faint. Um, there's a lot to this. There's so many. There's there's so much that we could expound in this in this one uh, verse because the word of God is so powerful, and and we should continually be in prayer. As we've talked about, the, the word of the Lord is, God's word is so powerful. And something that we've been saying over and over and over again, and I think we'll say it until we, we, we understand it fully, that God has given us his word. His word is quick and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing asunder soul, spirit, bone marrow, thought, and intent. God knows what you, you're thinking, and he knows the reason you're thinking it. He knows where your spirit ends and your soul begins. He knows where the bone and the marrow start and, and, and stop. He knows everything about you physically, spiritually, emotionally, everything, your thoughts, everything that is going on in your heart and going on in your world today. God knows every intricate detail of your life. And so the Bible says, Pray, uh, uh, men ought always to pray and not faint. Now, the word of God, God has given us his word because his word is powerful. And, and one of the things that we do when we, when we pray without ceasing is we use the word of God in prayer. And, and this, is, this is so powerful. We, we speak that word. Our God is a speaking God. He spoke and the worlds were formed. Our God is a speaking God. Jesus, Jesus spoke to those that, that, that were sick and they were healed. It, it, was, it was a speaking thing and we have to speak those things. We don't, we don't deny the things that may be taking us, that, that may have taken a hold of us, but we deny their right to be there according to the word of God. You see, when sickness comes upon our body, we're not denying that the sickness is there, but what we're saying is, by his stripes, I am healed. And you know what? I, I, I'm going to keep praying that. And I, when I'm getting up, when I'm sitting down, when I'm, when I'm going out, when I'm coming in, I'm going to keep praying those things. Why? Because his word tells me. And as he says, he has put his his word above his name, meaning if my, if my word isn't any good, then neither is my name. And we all know that his name is the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. That name is powerful. And so we should know that his word is just as powerful and just as reliable as his name. And so as we, this is, this is why, this is why it's so important in my heart, my heart for, for Life Ministries Church is that we would be a biblically literate church, that we wouldn't be illiterate like, like so much of, of, of what is going on in our world today in churches because they say, and it's not me saying this, but statistically speaking, they say that this is the most biblically illiterate generation that has ever lived. And why is it? We have, more, we have more access to the Word of God through smartphones, through computers, through technology, through, you can, you can, we probably own more, most of us in here probably own more than one Bible. Some of us probably own multiple Bibles. But why is it then that we are not, we, we are biblically illiterate? I can tell you why. Because we don't read the book. We don't read the Bible. We don't memorize Scripture. We don't take God at His Word. Why is it so important for me to memorize Scripture? It's important for me to memorize 
memorize scripture because when I'm praying, when I'm speaking against the enemy, scripture is one of the most powerful things that I have. You see, that sword is, is, is the only offensive weapon that is, that is listed or detailed in, in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 6. It's the offensive weapon. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So with the shield, I can, I can stop the fiery darts of the enemy. With, with the breastplate of righteousness, I'm righteous in Christ. I, I, and I love the, the where he begins. He says, shout your feet with the preparation of the gospel. And these are just, this is just, a. I mean, one day we'll go message by message and preach on each one. But the, the, but the preparation of the gospel, think about that. Your shoes being the preparation of the gospel, the very foundation, the very thing that you're standing on is the word of God. And then when you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the truth of God's word, that's the, that's the weapon that you use against the enemy. When Jesus was, in, it was being tempted by the devil for after 40 days, 40 nights, the, the, the one thing he did was he took the word of God against the enemy three times, spoke out of Deuteronomy, and, and he caused the enemy to flee. He beat the enemy up so bad with the word that the Bible says that he left him for a season. It's the word of God. Why does the enemy desire for us to be biblically illiterate? It is because he knows that he cannot fight against the word of God. Because God's word is true. God's word is established. God's word does not change today. And that's why it's so important for you and me. That when we hear the word of God, we, we take that word of God, we speak that word of God. That's why when you get up in the morning, you don't have to read all of these things. It's kind of like if we think that we're going to read all of this and, and internalize everything, then, then you know what? Sometimes we overload ourselves. It's like trying to eat, trying to go to a, a, a smorgasbord and, and just eat everything out there and say, well, I don't have to eat for another week. No, you'll be hungry tomorrow morning. The thing is is, is, is if we take the things that we read and we desire to understand them, we put those things to memory, then we have a weapon when the enemy comes against you and me. And that's where the power comes from. It comes from God's word. The scripture said, as many touched him were made whole in Mark chapter 6 and, and, and 56. Now, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on this because... We, we, we've talked about this, and, and this is far from easy believism. This is far from just mere positive confession. We're not doing those things. We're taking the word, and it's an offensive tool, an offensive weapon that we can take against the enemy, and we can defeat the enemy with the word, even as Jesus defeated him with the word. And so here's, here, here it is. We don't, we don't just quote it to say, well, well I'm, I'm just... I, it, it has to come to pass. No, we quote it and then we do something about it. You see, you might be, you might be depressed and all you have to say is the joy of the Lord is my strength. And therefore, I'm getting up today. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You, you, you stand up. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, devil, you can't bring accusation against me. If the Lord doesn't condemn me, who are you to condemn me, Satan? You, you, you see, you don't have to fight with him on your own terms and on, on your own, but you have the word of God to fight against him. So, so believing requires an effort. And we talked about this last week and, and we'll move on pretty quickly. It means you're going to have to do something about where you are, something that requires faith. It's not just about saying it, it's about doing something about it. Now, now I know, and, and, and here's the thing, David said he delivered me because he delighted in me. So you know what that means? If God's going to deliver me, it's because he delights in me. So what I've got to do is I've got to put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and fully trust in him and, and fall in love with Christ because the Bible says that when I love Christ, God loves me. He says he loves me and, and, and will hear me because I love Jesus Christ. So therefore, what I do is I take the word of God and I say, you know what? I put my trust in you, God. Show me, teach me how to delight myself in you. So that I can become a delight to you because you will deliver those who delight in you. And how do I delight in him? I delight in him by getting in his word. I delight in him by, by doing what he says and what he commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. 
The opposite side of that coin is true. If you don't, you won't. So the Bible says that, uh, that in, in Mark chapter 5 and, and 28, remember, she, she said, if I could touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And, and, and see, she understood that he is, he was, he was God. She understood. And so therefore, it was going to take an effort. And we talked about this last week. I'm not going to get into it this week. But it took an effort. She pressed in. She pushed through. She touched the hem of his garment. She was made whole. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And they said, what do you mean who touched you, Jesus? Everybody's touching you. He says, no, but someone touched me in faith. See, because faith is the one that takes a draw from the power of God. When we truly step out in faith, it's not about saying, oh, I think it's going to happen. I, I hope it's going to happen. No, I put my trust in you, Jesus. And therefore, I know that your word is true. If I believe that I am saved by grace, if I believe that the name of Jesus is the name that is above every name, then why is it so hard for me to believe that by his stripes I am healed? Think about it. Why is it so hard for us to believe in the delivering power of of God. And so this is this is this is the awesome thing that 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 Mark let me let me turn over there. Mark chapter chapter 5 is 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 where we were and and she was talking about these things. If I could but touch him, touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. I, I, now, now I want you to think about this because we explained this a little bit last week. We talked about how the hem of, the, hem of his garment and how the priest would have pomegranates and, and things hanging around the hem of his garment. And, and the Bible says that he would rise with, with healing in his wings, which could be translated also the hem healing in the hem of the garment. And so she understood as a Jew that if he is who he says he is, then I can touch his garment, be made whole. Now, I want you to think about this because she's, she in her mind was like, if he is who he says he is, then this is, this is possible. You move over one chapter, and we read this right at the onset, but one chapter over in, in chapter 6 and verse 56, and remember we talked about it a few weeks ago. The Bible says that wherever he went, in, 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 in chapter 6, verse 56, that whithersoever he, he entered into villages or cities or countries, they laid the sick in the streets and, streets and besought him that they might touch as it were, what? The border of his garment. They must have heard about this woman that had an issue of blood. You, you, you see, faith comes by, by what? By what? By hearing. They must have heard that this woman was healed because she touched the hem of his garment. And then all of a sudden they had heard that Jesus was in their town and they began to inquire and ask of him. And you can go back even a couple verses. We won't go back, but they said, would it be okay if we laid our sick and those that are in need down along the street, the streets? And as you walk by, they, they touch just the hem of your garment. Jesus agreed to it. Now look at what it says that that. They touched, as it were, but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Why? Because he rose with healing in his wings. You see, God, teach me how to touch the hem of your garment. God, teach me how to get so close to you that I can but, but, but reach up and touch you. You don't think God wants to be near you. As we said on Sunday, God is near the broken hearted. And when you're broken, whether it's sick, whether it's physical, mental, whatever it may be, you're in a broken state. God comes even closer. It's as if he draws closer. Yes, he lives in me. But there are moments in my life where his presence becomes very real. And it's usually in the, in the broken places, in the broken times where, where, where things are not going well. Jesus likes to show up in those moments. And, and, and you and I better understand that. So he's near to me when I am broken. See, but there's an enemy. And he will not go away 
unless we make him go away. You know, you, you can stand there and tell the devil, get away from me all day long. You, you can stand there and tell the devil all kinds of things, and he's not going to do anything. You could even speak the word of God to him. If it's not in faith, it won't do anything. You see, this is why it's so important for us to come to God in faith believing. The Bible says that they that come to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder. As we said last week, our faith should demand a a, a return. Our faith should demand to draw something from God. When I come to God, I believe that He is. Is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Matthew chapter 11. I, I, I love this. Matthew chapter 11. Uh, you know, let's just get into the word. Uh, verse 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not been risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Speaking of John the Baptist, he says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven, in one translation says, advances forcefully, and forceful men lay hold of it. So this means that in order for you and I to lay hold of the kingdom of heaven, we are going to have to take it by force. You see, for all of these people that talk about this, oh, it's so easy. For all these people that say, oh, once you get saved, that's all you have to do. I'm telling you this, they don't tell you to study your Bible. They don't tell you to do any of the things that that you should do. They don't tell you that you have to pray and that prayer is a requirement. But when I read the Bible and I look at Matthew chapter 6, Jesus didn't say if, but he said when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. These weren't suggestions. These were commandments. And if you love him, you will obey them. And why does he tell us? He doesn't tell us just because he, he wants us to, 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 to labor and we think that we're doing it for, for, for salvation. No, he wants us, he's giving us some weapons, some tools so that we can come against the very enemy of our soul. And so he says the kingdom of heaven advances forcefully and forceful men lay hold of it. So let the violent take it by force. It doesn't mean that we get violent towards other people, but I can tell you this, our faith should be a violent faith towards Satan himself. When we see others who are being mistreated, our faith should should begin to kick in. You see, when Jesus saw the creation that he had created broken, this was not the way that he had created, created it. So he saw it and he rose up in his faith and said, be made whole. Why his faith was violent, he was taking it back from the devil himself. He was taking territory back from the enemy that had possessed it up to that moment. And so you and I, if we are going to do anything, it is going to take us taking God at his word and becoming violent in our faith. Again, as I said, we don't become violent towards men. As a matter of fact, Jesus was the most meek man that ever, that ever walked the face of the earth. But when he came to the religious and he saw the religious doing something that they shouldn't be doing, the Bible says he walked into the temple and began to flip over the tables. Jesus knew. Jesus knew when. He knew when. So Daniel becomes desperate for an answer to the problems that his nation has, is facing. They've been taken into captivity. They've been, they've been exiled. They've been, they've been brought under the rule of an evil nation. And so Daniel becomes desperate for, for answers to, to problems that are, that are taking place. And so for 21 days, Daniel fasts and he prays without hearing one word from God. 
fasting and praying for 21 days and has not heard a single word. You see, Daniel became desperate and in his desperation, what his faith was doing is it was being stirred. Now, now, what do we do when nothing happens? What do we do when nothing happens? Many times we give up. Well, I prayed about it. Nothing happened. I guess God just does. He, he's not interested. How many things, how many things that we, that have we started praying for, but somewhere along the line, we stopped because, because the answer didn't come. And, and, and I guess, and I guess God said, no. Now God does say no sometimes, but when we know it's the will of God and the purpose of God and for God's glory, no is not an answer. You see, Daniel knew the, the word of God. Daniel knew what God wanted. Daniel knew what God was going to do. Do we give up or, or do, we, do we merely complain? Well, well, I don't know why God is, isn't answering me. And, 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 and I guess he just doesn't love me like he loves everybody else. I, I guess I'm just not his favorite. Almost, almost in the sense that we're trying to manipulate God as if, as if we can, we're, we're, we're just kind of got one eye on God. See if he's going to take the bait, right? <laughs> he's not taking the bait. He knows your thought and intent. Remember, the Bible says that the word of God knows the thought and the intent of your heart. So don't think that you can pull one over on God. You may be able to do it on your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister and your friends and everybody else. You may be able to use that reverse psychology on them, but it won't work with God. God knows exactly what's on your heart. Or Isaiah chapter 50, if you will. I don't know about you, but I love, I, I, I love the book of Isaiah. I just love the word of God. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I get a new chapter all the time. I, I, I get a new favorite all the time. And tomorrow I'll have another one because it'll be the one I'm reading tomorrow. Praise God. Praise God. But I, but I want you to see something here. You see, we're talking about the enemy. The enemy that has come in. The enemy of your soul. But, but here's what Isaiah says in, 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 in chapter 50, in verse 7. He says, For the Lord God will help thee, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Some of you, your Bibles say, and, and this, is, there, this, this, script, this passage is very prophetic in, in the life of Jesus because you can go back and into and, and verse 6. He says, I gave my back to the sinners and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I, I hid not my face from the shame and spitting. You see, speaking of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But see, here's, here the prophet is saying, I've, I've, some, some of the other translations say, I've set my face like a stone. And I am determined, I am determined to do the will of God. You see, the enemy has come against me. He has fought against me. He's fought against you. And this is what Isaiah is saying. No matter how, how, how strong the enemy comes against me, I can tell you this today. I have set myself like flint. You know what a flint rock is? A flint is what they make arrows out of. A flint is what they use. It's a flint stone. And, and it's very sharp. It, it, it's sharp as a razor. But he set his face as flint against the enemy. Meaning the enemy will not be able to stop me. I will penetrate the darkness and God's will will be done in my life. For all of these people that say, you're not going to have any struggles, just confess Jesus and just this, and trust in the, trust in the, what, the work that He's done. Yes, trust in the work that He's done, but He said you were saved for good works, and there is a real enemy that is fighting against your soul. The enemy prowls around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. But I've set my face like flint, and His and God's will will be done. And that's the word of God. 
You see, you take that word and you begin to proclaim that word. You wake up in the morning and when you you feel the enemy coming against you and it just seems like the trials and the cares of life and everything else are telling you to quit and people around you are saying you are nothing and you'll never become nothing. You know what? Set your face like flint. Don't take your eyes off of the prize and just press into Jesus Christ because I can tell you this, He will deliver you because He says, I know that I should shall not be ashamed his will will be done see the bible goes on in verse 8 he says he is near he is near that justifieth me who will contend with me oh man you see the boldness now beginning to rise you 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 see his faith now beginning to rise I, i i wanna if i can go here Isaiah 50, where are we at? Verse verse 10, he says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys his servants? If you're walking in darkness without a ray of light, trust in the Lord and rely upon your God. Now, Now hear this. He says, if you're walking in darkness... And there is no light. Hear that again. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys his servants? His servant. If you are are walking in darkness without a ray of light. Meaning, if, if you're in a dark place today and it seems hopeless. If you're in a bad place, in a bad situation, depression, oppression, negative thoughts, all of these things seem to be pressing on you. It seems like you will never get ahead. It seems like your life will never come back on track. It seems like nothing will ever work out for you again. And the devil is pressing you down today. See, that's the dark place where the enemy wants to hold you tonight. He says, he that's in a dark place and there's not even a ray of light he says put your trust in the Lord your God why he's going to lead me out his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path I may not be able to see very far in front of me, but I can see the word of God leading me. I may not see three three steps where I'm going, but God will show me where to put the next step. You see, he will not cause my foot to stumble. Why? Because I have put my trust in the Lord my God. You see, my God is real. We know that the enemy is real today, but how come we think God is absent We know that the enemy and darkness is all around us. But how come we think that darkness is greater than light? You know, if we turned all the lights off in this place, it would be pretty dark. And it would be pitch dark. But we could light a small match or or, or or, or, or just take two rocks together and, 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 and just rub them together and there'd be a spark. And the greatest darkness can't hide the, the, the smallest light. See, the Bible says that the earth was without form and void and there and darkness and everything. And God said, now let there be light. And that small light began to broke, break forth and it pushed back the greatest darkness. You see, light is greater than darkness by a thousand times, by infinity, light is greater than darkness. Why do not we believe that our God is greater than anything that the enemy is trying to do in our lives? Yes, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This will not last forever. Whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, if God is your, is, if you're putting your trust in God, then I can tell you this, He will deliver you. I, I, I want to even bring it back, if you will. And, 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 and I want to I wanna come back over here to, to chapter 49 and I'm going and and, and to read a little bit out of the New Living Translation because I, I, I have trouble. I, I love the way the King James says things. I love the way that it'll be all right. It'll be all right. I, verse 24, I want, you to, I, I want you to see this. 
Because the enemy is going to come against you. Who can snatch the plunder of war from the hands of a warrior? And who can demand that a tyrant let his captives go? But the Lord says, The captives of the warriors will be released, and the plunder of tyrants will be retrieved. For I, (laughs) say that with me, for I will fight those who fight you. And he says, I will fight those who fight you, and I will save your children. How many of you have children that are lost tonight? How many of us have loved ones that are lost tonight? And the enemy has come in and he has snatched them. Why? With his power, with his darkness. The Bible says that the people love darkness. They, they love darkness. They don't realize that they're, in bo- they're, being, they're bound and that they're in chains. But he says, he says, you don't have to worry about them. I know what the enemy has done. He says, I'll cause them to release it. Why? Because it's not your battle, it's mine. I, I, I don't know about you, but I want the Lord fighting my battles because he can go and retrieve what belongs to me. And he promises to bring back those things into my house. You see, I don't have to fight these things. He says, and I will save your children. I will feed your enemies with their own flesh. They will be drunk with rivers of their own blood. And the world will know, and here's the whole reason, the whole purpose... That I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. Why am I going to do it? Because they are going to know who did it. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. But it was God fighting on my behalf and on your behalf. What an awesome God we serve. See, we can, we can sit here and play around with this. But my thing is, is I want you to get the word. Because it isn't going to do you any good if, you're not, if, if, if you don't know what's being said. That's why I, I advise, take notes. At least write the scriptures down. At least write the scriptures down. Why? Because all week long, you're going to need them. You're going to need them when you begin to face the enemy. You're going to need them when the enemy tries to come against you. I've set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. I know my God shall deliver me. He knows where I am right now. The Bible says if one sparrow falls to the ground, God knows. And you are worth more than many sparrows. I would dare say all the sparrows that have ever been, one soul is worth more to God. You see, he knows where you are. I want you to see this. Deuteronomy. See, Jesus quoted out of Deuteronomy three times when he came against the enemy. Deuteronomy is a good book. Amen. Take it, take it with you. Use it. Fight against the enemy with it. The Deuteronomy. 31. I'll get there. See, I, I didn't bring my glasses, but I just have to stand back a little bit and read. <laughs> Praise God. We'll get it read, though. Amen. We'll get it read. Deuteronomy 30, uh, 31. And I want you to see this because this is so powerful. These, these are scriptures that we know, but maybe you, 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 you just weren't familiar where they were from. He says, look, listen to this. I'll back up one. Verse 5, And the Lord shall give them up before your face that you may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Now, now hear what he says. Be strong and of good courage... He's telling you and I, why would he tell you and me, be strong of good courage? Why would he tell us that tonight? Because he knows that there are things that are, that are testing our strength and our courage tonight. He knows that you are facing some things that are testing your strength and your courage. Why? Because there's a part of you that wants to fear. There's a part of you that wants to buckle. There's a part of you that's saying, you know what? I don't know if I can do this, 
Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that does that, that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will never leave me or forsake me. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. He will never leave me or forsake me. I'm not forsaken. I'm not forgotten. God knows right where I am tonight. And He knows my trial. He knows my circumstances. He knows my situation. He knows it all. I, I, I love it. I love it. You could, you could even go through that whole chapter in Isaiah 50. If you go back there, I, I'm not going to go through it all. But, but, but there, there are some things that I want you to see. Because, see, this is why it's so important for you to just read and, and, and eat the Word of God. And, and allow the Word of God to just, man, fill you. God, God begins to speak to them. He says, is my hand shortened? In, in, in verse 2, at the end of verse 2, he says, Wherefore, when I, when I came, was there, was there no man? When I called, was there, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Like, like where, where, where are the ones that, where are your accusers? Where are those? He, he's like, he's like I'm, I'm here. Where are they? I'm here. Somebody is, and, and it's, as if, it's as if God is saying, if they really want to fight, <laughs> if they really want to fight, then, then I'm here. Listen, listen to the way it says it. Why is, why is no one there when I came? Why didn't anyone answer when I called? Is it because I have no power to rescue? No, that's not the reason. For I can, I can speak and the, uh, to the sea and make it dry up. I, I can turn rivers into deserts covered with, with dying fish. I dress the skies in darkness, covering them with clothes of mourning. I, I the Lord, the sovereign Lord has has given me his words of wisdom. And see, this is something, this is something that I speak over myself all the time. God, you have given me wisdom. Why? Because my mind may not understand it or comprehend it, but I can call upon the name of the Lord. He says, anyone who lacks wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it to him. So I can pray, and see, and this is where I use the word, God give me wisdom, because you know what I need to do in this situation. I may not know what to do, but I need your wisdom. Now listen to what he says. He says, you give me wisdom, uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Ooh. The sovereign Lord has given me words of wisdom, verse 4, so that I know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning, I want you to hear this, he wakes me and opens my understanding to his will. You know what you need to begin to pray? Lord, wake me up every morning and begin to reveal your will for me today. Lord, wake me up every morning and begin to reveal your will, will for me today. Show me what it is that you desire of me. See, in verse 4, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Now, I want you to think about that in the, in the way that he puts it in the King James. Somebody's, somebody's hurting out there, God. Give me wisdom. Give me words to speak to them to restore their soul. You see, when I begin to speak, what, it, what is it? It's not me speaking anymore. I'm speaking not about God, but I'm speaking for Him. I'm no longer just a, a, just a, a, a mere, a, a just, you know, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus says about you. You see, now, now you have become, as the Bible says, the oracles of God. You have become the voice of God. You begin to speak into, into the life of your children. You begin to speak these things. You begin to tell your children. It doesn't matter what they're acting like. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter. How. You just begin to tell them, you are the, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
And as a righteous person, I know that this isn't the right behavior, but God has purchased you. He has bought you with a price and you are not your own. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You begin to speak those things. You are wise. God has given you wisdom and, and, and you keep speaking it until you begin to see that wisdom emerge. You begin to speak it until they begin to believe it themselves. And, the, and, and what you'll begin to do as you do that, because I do it driving down the road. The Bible says as you're coming in, as you're going out, write it on the door post do it everywhere I, I we're, we're driving down the road we we say our prayers and even after our prayers and this is what i believe he means when he says pray without ceasing men ought always to pray is this that we begin to speak and we begin to say those things god thank you thank you for the wisdom thank you for your favor that is upon my life today god thank you god for for for, for giving me the opportunities and the opportunity to serve you and to glorify your name today you see, you, you're, you're speaking the word of God over your life, over your children's life. And, and I'll say, and thank you, God, for my, for my daughters. Thank you on the way to school. Thank you, God, that, 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 Father, that they belong to you and that their minds are yours, God, and that they have the mind of Christ. And, and you begin to speak those things. I'm telling you, those things that are not as though they are and they will become. Why? Because God's word is powerful. That's why it's so necessary for us to take the word of God and use it. You see, we hold the sword, but we don't know how to wield it. And, and I pray today that you're, you're learning at least how to wield that thing. How do I pick it up? How do I use it against the enemy? How do I take the, the, take the battle to him? You see, the violent take it by force. I set myself my face like flint. And God's will will be done. See the angel of the Lord came to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. And you can turn there. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 verse 22. Go back to verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin. You think of Daniel. Daniel, you're talking about Daniel? If Daniel had to confess sin, you think we have to confess our sin still? I, I believe so. Jesus, Jesus told us too. He said, Father, forgive. When you pray, you pray like this. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Meaning forgive us our sin as we forgive those who have sinned against us. If I can't forgive those who have sinned against me, how can God forgive me for sinning against Him? And so, God, forgive me as I forgive those who have sinned against me. In other words, I release them, I release them, and God's saying, then I release you of your sin. I release you of the power of that sin that, that, that had, it had over your life. You see, this is why it's so powerful. As I was praying and confessing my sin. Now see, Daniel did, wasn't just praying about his sin. You have to understand, Daniel was interceding for a nation. And so Daniel, he was confessing the sins of the nation, but he didn't make them a separate thing. He didn't say, the sin of your people. He said, forgive me my sin. Because me and the people are one. It, it wasn't like Cain. I, I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't know where, where Abel is. He knew right where Abel was. He, he, he knew right where he buried him. He knew right where he, he, he killed him. But he says, he says, forgive me for my sin, uh, for, for confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer. See, this was something, if you remember, Daniel did three times a day. I'm not saying that you have to do it three times a day. The Bible tells us continually. What, what does that mean? Continually. If I do something and I know it was wrong, immediately I cry out and I say, God, forgive me. I shouldn't have responded that way. I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have had that thought. God, forgive me. You see, I, I, I don't have to wait. But Daniel did this three times a day and, and, and he had a, a special place that he did it. And he said... While I was yet speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the even, evening oblation. 
And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. You see, Daniel knew the the very first moment that he had begun to speak with God. He says, I am come to give thee thy understanding. The very moment that Daniel had begun to pray the prayer 21 days prior, there was a commandment given. The answer didn't come for 21 days. Why? There was warfare that was taking place. You see, the angel Gabriel will will go on to explain to Daniel, as I was on my way with the answer, the, the prince of Persia withstood me. See, Satan has his demons in ranks. He has order. Why? Because he knows. He knew. He saw what God had done firsthand. And that God is a God of order. And so he, he, was, he was being withstood by the, by, the, by the prince of Persia. Now here's the thing. The angel Gabriel wasn't alone in the battle because there was a man named Daniel on his knees praying. And that's why the warfare was taking place. And as the prayer became more intense and more fervent because he wasn't about to take no for an answer. God does, speaks in to, to, the, to the angel Michael and releases Michael to go and contend with the, with the prince of Persia so that Gabriel can be released to give the answer to Daniel. See, the, 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 the prayer was becoming fervent. The, 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 the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You, you, you see, the fervent prayer isn't always the first prayer. Sure, the first prayer you may pray fervently. But it, all, it, it isn't always the first prayer, the very fervent prayer. The, the longer that gold is sitting in that pot, the hotter it begins to get the more fervent it becomes. The longer something stays in the fire, the hotter it becomes. The longer you and I stay in the trial, the more desperate we become and the more fervent our prayers become. You, you, you see why? You, see, you, you say, well, I prayed. No, you, you obviously haven't prayed yet. Because you, when, when, you become, when you get to a place of fervent prayer, that fervent prayer can't be put out very easily. You see, because a fervent prayer isn't a prayer that quits. A fervent prayer is a prayer that stays. A fervent prayer will consume everything in its path. You see, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. That that means fervent. Everything in His path, He consumes it. A fervent prayer will push everything else, else out of the way. And it will get what it desires. And see, in day Daniel prayed... And God said, enough of this playing around. Michael, you take his place. And so he says, Michael, the archangel came contending with the prince of Persia right now. And that's why I've been released. And so that's why I'm here. See, I can tell you this. Demons will delay the answer to your prayer because devils are just as real as in our day as they were in Daniel's day. You may not believe that. But demons are just as real in our day as they were in Daniel's day. See, if the devil can discourage you, you will be discouraged. He's not going to stop. If you, I'm telling you, he's not going to stop until you make him stop. This is the thing. The devil, the devil still doesn't have the power that he, he claims to have. You can wear him out. You can resist him, the Bible says. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. See, we have to realize that we are in a war. And in wartime, things may not come as easily, but they will come if we don't quit. They will come if we don't give up. I'll close with this in Revelation. And I want you to go there with me. Revelation starting in chapter 2. I'm just going to read some verses out to you tonight. And and they're they're in chapters 2 and 3. He's speaking to the seven churches. But remember, 
to him that overcomes, to he, him that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, this is what it says. He says, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life. You see, there's a reward for overcoming. There's a reward for not quitting. And in, in, in verse, uh, verse 11, the last part of the verse, he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. I want you to think about this because this is, this is to you, to me, to those of us who don't quit, but we overcome. In verse 17, he says, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of, of the hidden manna that, and, and he and will give him a white stone, and in, in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receives it. Man, that's going to be so awesome. Y- you think about this. This is, this is literal. Because, because unless it, can, it can't be explained literally, this is the way prophecy is always to be interpreted. If you can't take it literally, then, then it, you can interpret it spiritually. But he's going to give a white stone. There's going to be a name in it. And nobody's going to know what it means but you. Why? Because you are special to God. And there is something that he, he put in you that he didn't put in anybody else. There's nobody else on this planet ever has been, ever will be that is just like you. In verse 26, he says, He that overcomes and keeps my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Hallelujah. See, we're going to rule and reign with him. See, when we get to heaven, it's not just going to be... It's going to be joy. It's going to be peace. There's not going to be all of the overwhelming circumstances. This isn't going to be a duty. This isn't going to be a job in the sense that you're going to hate to do it. No, he says, you're going to rule and reign with me. You're going to know exactly what to do, how to do it, and you're going to have the authority to do it. And there's not even going to be a question. You're going to rule and reign. In verse 5 of chapter 3, he says, He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I, will, and, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That means you'll be saved. You'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. You, he, he, you, you weren't ashamed of him. He won't be ashamed of you tonight. Amen. Praise God. I'm telling you, we have so much to look, look forward to. In verse 12, he says, He that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Man, such, such an awesome thing. You know, when we think of royalty, when we think of, 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 of excellence, the, the, the most awesome thought that we have, it can't even compare to what it's going to actually be when we stand before God because we've never seen, we've never seen clothing like we're going to see in heaven. We've, we're, we're, we've never seen tapestries like we're going to see in heaven. We've never seen anything like we're going to see when we get to heaven. It's going to be so awesome that we're just going to be be just I, I think for the first thousand years we're just gonna be, you know just kind of looking around like what I mean it's 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 going to be awesome and it's a reality this isn't a fairy tale this is this is reality now listen to what he says in final one verse 25 or t- verse uh, 21 see I don't have my glasses the numbers are small <laughs> he says to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my Father in His throne. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, even now. The Bible tells that that to us in Ephesians chapter 1, that you and I are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And God has put all of the power of Satan under your feet. 
See, we are overcomers today. Not because somebody said, but because God's word tells us. You see, when you're, when you're facing the trial that you're going through, you just remember, I'm more than an overcomer. I'm more than a, a conqueror in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I can overcome. Why? Because he overcame. I will overcome. Why? Because he told me I'll overcome. And so whatever you're facing, I will overcome this thing. I will, get, I, I will come out of this. I will be victorious. God will get the glory out of my life. God will get the glory out of your life. And, and you need to know that whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that God is, that, that has allowed to be in your life today, I can tell you he has made the way of escape. And that's the actual translation when you, when you talk about if for every trial that you're going through, some people, the, some, some translations say he, he makes a way of escape. No, there's not a way, meaning many different ways. It is the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus Christ is the way out. He's the way of escape out of anything that you may be facing today. Set your face like flint. Put it on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll bring you out of it for the glory and the honor of his, names, of his name. And he will fight your battles for you. He will overcome your enemies. He will bring your children home. He will do it because he promised it in Jesus' name.